All right, everyone. Uh, good evening and welcome. My name is Samir Asmer, and along with Natalia Brezuela, I'm the co director of the projects of the ICCTP, the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs. Um, I welcome you uh, to our third and final gathering in the series Thinking from Palestine, Dispossession, Liberation, Return. To think from Palestine here at UC Berkeley first requires first and foremost recognizing and acknowledging that Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchun, the ancestral and ceded land of the Chorchenyo speaking all on people, the successors of the historic sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. With this land acknowledgement, I affirm indigenous sovereignty over the land and my commitment as a scholar to continue to hold UC Berkeley accountable to the demands, not only the needs, of the American Indians and indigenous peoples both here and elsewhere. Land acknowledgements are essential, however, they can quickly become ritualistic unless we include them in a more encompassing praxis, research into, study of, and commitment to a world in struggle against settler colonialism, both here and elsewhere, including in Palestine. In the spirit of this study and struggle, Natalia Brizuela and I curated this series over perhaps a year ago. Since then, Israel's obliteration of the Palestinians has intensified becoming a genocide in Gaza, removal from the land in the West Bank, evacuation from the public sphere in Israel, and arrests and tortures of Palestinians uh, across the, history, uh, the geography of Palestine. Israel's project, no doubt, is to make the land uninhabitable for Palestinians, to sever the relationship between them and Palestine, and to suppress all anti-colonial resistance that refuses the sever. Hence, the emphasis of this series has always been not only on, this, on dispossession, but also on liberation and return. This emphasis is ever more urgent at present. Aside from a workshop we're hosting in Tunis on the rhythms of revolt in a couple of months, our gathering this evening is probably the last in-person event that Natalia and I are organizing on campus as the co-directors of the projects of the ICCTP for the past four years. Right, now, right, Brianna? This is our last year. Yeah. We have been able to carry out our projects with the generous support from the Andrew Mellon Foundation and the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. We thank them for their support and generosity. In imagining how we would conclude our four years of collective study, Palestine proposed itself as not only the place, but also the cause that condenses so many of the troubles and hopes of this world. Troubles and hopes we have been studying, researching, and publishing on for the past four years. Before I introduce our guest, Nasir Abu Rahmi, uh, in conversation with Shara Chari, I would like to thank Brianna George, the manager of the ICCTP. Everything we do is possible because of her work. I also want to thank our colleague, Nora Jacobson Ben Hamid for her support of the series. And finally, thank you to the Center of Middle East Studies and the Department of Rhetoric for co-sponsoring the series. So now, it gives me great personal pleasure to host Nasser Abu Rahmi on our campus and to introduce him. He is a writer and academic and currently assistant professor of Middle Eastern and Northern, uh, North African studies at Bowdoin College. His work is between comparative colonial history, political geography, and political theory, and has published broadly across journals and edited collections. I will mention a few of my favorite pieces. Of Monsters and Boomerangs, Colonial Returns in the Late Liberal City, in the journal City. The Camp, in the journal Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. 
and revolution after revolution, the commune as line of flight in Palestinian anti-colonialism in critical times. I have also just read a piece of his, a forthcoming, forthcoming piece in radical philosophy titled In Tune with Their Times. His book, The Time Beneath the Concrete, Camp, Colony, Palestine, is forthcoming with Duke University book, uh, Press. I will just say, because he will say more and Sharad will say more, that I think the book is historic. First, in the most immediate sense that nothing like it on the topic has been written before, but also in a second sense that the work is conscious of the historical juncture it inhabits, of its own historical time, it performs the struggle over and within the time it studies. In conversation with him is our own Sharad Shari of the geography department, and who does not need many introductions to this audience, but I will say that in addition to his many articles, he is the author of Fraternal Capital, Peasant Workers, Self-Made Men, and Globalization in Provincial India, and more recently, Gramsci and C. His long-awaited book, Apartheid Remains, will see the light also with Duke University Press in about a month from now. Please help me welcome Nasser Awar. Wow, thank you for that incredible introduction. And thank you all for being here. I'm not sure I'm gonna do that introduction justice, but I'm gonna try. Um, and let me also thank Brianna and Natalia and Sharad for doing me the honor of being in conversation. Um, it's not really easy to be anywhere these days, but uh, it's nice to be here. Okay, uh, I'm gonna start with the unavoidable and I'm gonna start with genocide. Um, not just because I can't really talk or think about anything else myself these days, but also because I think what I'm talking about in this book and what I'm trying to get at in this book in terms of settler colonialism as an impasse, in terms of the persistence of these forms of life uh, under duress, and the camps uh, really is at the core of what's going on today. Um, which is to say that I think the only way to really understand why we have gotten to where we are today, this almost frenzied, obliterating, total violence that we are bearing witness to, is really to come to terms with Zionism as a settler colonial project that is at an impasse. It is, it is at a foundational impasse in my reading. And it is at a foundational impasse in my reading because it's defined by the stuntedness of its conquest. I don't want to say the incompletion of its conquest because conquest is always incomplete at some level, but by the stuntedness of its conquest. It is a project that is unable, in my reading, to transition beyond that foundational moment. Um, and political orders that can't close those moments of conquest, that can't transition from the, the foundation of order to the maintenance of order are vulnerable orders. They are unsettled and they are dangerous orders. And we can see this unsettledness in the sheer demographic contradictions that Zionism has produced over the last seven decades. When Zionism uh, establishes, it's premised on the establishment of a racial majoritarian Jewish state. That's its raison d'etre since at least 1905. And yet today it finds itself ruling over some 7 million native Palestinian subjects, over half the population that it controls. And that it has no ability or inclination to absorb into its body politic in any form whatsoever. Right? This is you know, quite simply an irreducible contradiction. But from the standpoint of the state, it's also an immunological disaster at some level. One that in my sense, condemns it to a constant reenactment of that violence of conquest. And so in the kind of long-term historical sense, which is, I think, the temporal horizon, the temporal sense that now imposes itself on Zionism, i.e. this project is, un is unable to keep going on in the holding pattern it's been in for a, quite a while now, it's, it's really kind of uh, faces, the project really only has two options at some point, right? either self-negation in the form of equality or genocide and obliteration. Um, so from the standpoint of a, of, a, of a settler order that's stuck, that feels besieged, genocide is not really an Ill, illogical choice. It's not really just punitive. Right? It's a way out. It's a search for a way out. Um, it's a kind of corrective return, if you will, to that 
foundational buildings. So the, the, the conjuncture, I think the conjuncture is really defined by that dual sense, by this dual sense of opportunity and threat, by frustration, impasse at, uh, on, on the one level, and a sense of freedom and exit on the other. I think that's what really kind of defines the conjuncture now from that standpoint. And I think that dual sense is where we can locate both the nature of this violence, right? It's limitless sort of uh, status. There are no red lines in this violence. But also everything that comes with it, right? The sheer, uh, the sheer will to discourse, the sheer incitement, the genocidal incitement that is so pervasive and seemingly irrepressible, right? And I mean the almost daily calls. They've been toned down a little bit now out of fear of, of courts, but the almost daily calls to flatten, to wipe, to annihilate, that permeated this system. Um, but also in the affective discharge around the violence, right? And I mean the clamor, the mockery, the sort of ritualized humiliation that we see, uh, this kind of constant imagery that pours out, right? The, 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 the imagery of soldiers posing within the lingerie of women they've displaced or killed, which is incessant. Um, I think, you know, the only way to kind of, you know, it's, the only way to kind of come to terms with all of that is to recognize this sort of very, uh, this release of long pent up frustration in the kind of libidinal drive of this project, or the release of long pent up exterminatory energies that I think have always been there, but have been, have been sort of uh, uh, stuck for a long time. And that now feel free in this moment, a moment of vulnerability, but also license to pursue this object of design. So really what I want to say in these, in these sort of prefatory remarks is that the genocidal turn is a way out, it's a search for a way out of the foundational impasse of this project, right? Um, that's, that's how I, I, I understand it. And what the book essentially is about is about this temporal impasse. It is about the impasse and it is about the forms of life and the forms of refusal that have shaped this impasse, that have kept the impasse as an impasse in a, in a certain sense. Um, and I want to say now, I want to give a few remarks about the conceptual arc of the book. And then if time allows, I will, um, I will try to concretize this a little bit by drawing on, on one of the chapters in, 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 in due course. So at the core of the book is the claim that settler colonialism everywhere really is, is always as much a conquest of time as it is a conquest of life which is to say it is everywhere a particularly, and I argue even a peculiarly, fraught struggle over time. And settler orders everywhere uh, rely on the creation of new beginnings, new beginnings that both uh, sort of wipe the slate before them, they exclusivize historicity, whereas in the Zionism's return to the land, or, um, uh, or American Manifest Destiny, but at the same time they mark the start of civilizational or sovereign time, right? The new point zero. Uh, so, you know, settler declarations of independence are an example of this, or uh, the slogan of making the desert bloom is another example of this. In the anti-colonial tradition, I think Fanon understood this better than anyone. And he wrote that uh, the colonists make history and know it. He said they are invested, and I think he chose that word very um, particularly, he said they are invested with the, they are invested with the beginning. We made this land. And what I want to add to that is that, yes, if, if the colonist makes history and knows it, the colonists also feel the vulnerability of that history. They, fear that, they feel that history's vulnerability. Because settler orders, I think, remain dogged by the question of time and foundation, to varying degrees. They remain orders that even centuries after their foundational events can be stricken with the sort of old enmities, malaise that open up even existential anxieties. As an, as an aside, I think any grappling with what we call the polarization of this country today around things like critical race theory or everything that goes under the shorthand of popular discourse of the 1619 project versus the 1776 project or monuments and reparations or even things that don't seem quite so close like mass incarceration and its relationship to enduring forms of dispossession um, or even gun culture and gun violence. Um, I think any grappling with those will uh, sort of take you back to the unresolved endurances of, of that history in this country. Not the, the kind of eternal past of 
colonial history, but it's contemporary deformations, it's endurances in, in the present, right? It's impalements in, in the present. I think that I think uh, I think that's that's what you would end up grappling with. Um, my claim in the book is that this fraught struggle over time is nowhere really more apparent than in the question of Palestine. As I as I said. Zionism as a settler colonial project, in my reading, defined by its inability to move past the past. Right? It's stuck at that moment. Um, so in a very real sense, uh, time is the object of struggle in Palestine. If you want, at a in a fundamental sense, the struggle is a struggle between a political order that seeks to close time, right? seeks to close time in regimes of law and property, that would render dispossession a mere technical formality or a thing of a bygone thing of the past, and forms of politics, forms of refusal and return, that seek to keep the time of foundation open. Right? They they refuse a closure. They seek to obstruct the transition to a presentist regime of law and property. I think that is at some basic level the 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 way to understand the the, the nature of the struggle. Why is this transition important? Why, and what does it have to do with the camps? The question of transition in my reading is important because it is about the central drive that structures all settler colonial projects, which is the drive towards self-supersession. And here I'm, I'm borrowing from Patrick Wolf and I'm borrowing from Lorenzo Veracini, and I have some misgivings about Veracini's treatment of settler colonialism and Zionism, but I think in this respect, I think he's fundamentally correct which is to say that every settler colony at a structural level, not just in a historical, but at a structural level, um, seeks to transition and achieve itself in the settler ceasing to be settler, in the settler becoming a, a defunct political category, a given. Right? In other words, settler colonial projects ultimately seek to move forward, even if they never accomplish that fully, but they seek to move forward um, or move toward not just the elimination of the native, which we're fairly well accustomed to, but also the nativization of the settler. Yes, um, to to remain in a state of temporal irresolution or question is, I think, a problem. It's a bind, um, and I think there are ways that I can come back to in, in the in the Q&A, in which that sort of temporal irresolution can be an advantage, it can be a sort of productive failure. And there are moments in American settler history in which it really was a productive failure um, at, at certain points in the 19th century, and I can come back to it. But I think at, at a fundamental level, it's a problem. It's a bind. It's something you have to resolve. And I think that's clear enough in Zionism's surface-level anxieties and its demands, its injunctions, right? The demand to be recognized as a Jewish state by its victims, by those it has dispossessed, not just by the rest of the world, by those it has dispossessed, which is in fact a demand that the dispossessed accept their dispossession as final and uh, irrefutable. The, the fears and the campaigns and the tens of millions of dollars poured into uh, the fear of what it calls delegitimization, uh, the constant uh, uh, declarations of its right to exist as a state and a political project the energy poured into its diplomatic normalization and recognition, and so on. There's a long list. These mark the regime's drive towards what I would understand in this framework, a kind of self-supersession, a kind of transition. Now, I, I should be clear that um, the, imp the, the, the impasse, the inability to transition, doesn't mean Israel is sort of less complete or less successful than uh, other settler colonial orders. And I want to get away from a sort of success-failure binary or the sense that, you know, dispossession is a done deal in the rest of the settler colonial world. Um, it's not. I don't think it is. It's not, it's not finished anyway. But it does mean that uh, Zionism is more stuck. It's more stuck both in the temporal sense that I've been trying to get at, but it is also stuck with a blunt set of political instruments. A blunt set of political instruments that really, in their own right, obstruct and belie its claims to transition and normalization. Right? Uh, and these include things like formal apartheid and the distinction between nationality and citizenship. The Israeli nation is a, is a, the Israeli state rather, is a state that does not recognize an Israeli nationality. It's been an access split between nationality and citizenship that's absolutely foundational to its political order. But um, also things like 
permanent military occupation, the longest running military occupation in modern history, permanent states of siege, large scale warfare that seems permanent and unending that's now taken this genocidal obliterating modality. But also, and I think most tellingly for me, the systematic reliance on extra legal discretionary settler violence. It's reliance, it is central to how this project achieves itself. Right, which means it's dependence on the frontier mob, essentially. Right, the mob is a political actor, is a political subject within this project in its own right. Now, every settler colonial order, in some way, every colonial order, really, not just a settler colonial order, initially relied on a, a frontier mob. Right, and that's how the, the West was won, after all. But in most of, in, at least in the sort of Anglo-American sphere. Um, that temporal and legal gap was closed. Yes, you'd re retroactively legalize what the mob achieved, undoubtedly. Um, that's, how you, that's how you claimed the land. But you close that gap. You, the law extends, the law eventually reaches. Um, now, of course, that, that doesn't mean it ever really goes away. And, that, that, and that's, that's my reference about gun culture and gun violence, right? Mm -hmm. What is gun culture and gun violence? It's also the entailment, the endurance of the centrality of the, the frontier mob, of the pioneers um, that, that endures, right? It's if you want, you know, the significance of the frontier in American history doesn't end. Right? He, was, he was right and it keeps, <laughs> and it keeps on going. Um, Zionism, by contrast, has never been able to close that gap. Right? So uh, even the move to a sort of market-based form of management, say, with land, right? and the transformation of land into a fungible private property relation remains foreclosed. Land has become a commodity, undoubtedly, but it's a commodity that the state owns, right? 93, 94% of all land is still held by the state and in, and in public bodies. Um, in turn, all of the positive instruments of elimination that have been quite integral to settler colonial projects everywhere, right? By positive, by positive what is meant is the, 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 that they create something new, that they're not destructive in the same way, things like assimilation, Things like miscegenation, things like native citizenship, things like the uh, transformation of native title into individual freehold, and so on. All of these are really foreclosed. There are not tools and instruments that the, that the regime can use in any meaningful way. Um, let alone the possibility of a turn to more liberal procedural uh, uh, forms of things like the politics of recognition, right, or the politics of apology, or the land acknowledgments. Right? Um, as cunning and as eliminatory as the politics of recognition can be, it still is able to, uh, on the surface at least, uh, appear like some sort of historical movement, of a historical transition. Um, the, uh, Zionism really does not have any of this at its disposal. And in my opinion, it will never reach that, not now. Right? That pathway where Zionism could have established a political order that would have transitioned to a set of instruments like this is already gone. It's a, it's a future past. I want to turn to the camp now, because I think this is this is really where the question of the camp is located. Because the the Palestinian refugee camp, and that's what my concern here um, emerges as a direct effect of the dispossession and of the expulsion of the native population. But it also endures as a, a kind of material artifact of that of the irresolution of that history. Right? So the, 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 the camps here for me are, are not a metonym. I'm not really uh, using them as a metaphor per se, even if I slide into metaphors sometimes unwillingly, but they're not really that. And they're not simply a paradigm or an exemplum, which is a, a certain way of thinking through the, the camp object. Um, but they are materially present. They are objects and life worlds that are materially present at the center of this ongoing history of this and let me just situate you a, a little bit before I, I, I turn again. There are today 58 official UNRWA camps, right? These are the official UN administered camps across the region, but a, which about a million and a half people inhabit. The vast majority of these camps were established in 1949 after the ethnic cleansing, the expulsion of about 800,000 um, Palestinians in what, what is commemorated as, as the Nakba, about half the population of Palestine. Although there's a significant number that will come up now 
uh, about six that were established in Jordan after the 1967 war. Right? These were established uh, mainly to uh, shelter about 300,000 people that were pushed out of the West Bank, most of them refugees, twice displaced, and they went from one camp to another. Um, in 1949, uh, on the recommendations of uh, Gordon Clapp, who was then director of the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, there's this UN agency called the United Nations, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency that is inaugurated. Um, and it takes over as a sort of interim developmental, sort of humanitarian, but not really, a solution to the question. Right? And it gets too near uh, scant terms of reference when it's established. The first instructing it to do this relief and uh, work uh, and employment in the camps. And the second, which underlines how interim it, it was, instructing it to begin preparing for its undoing, essentially, for handing over its responsibilities to the host governments, what were called the host governments, i.e. the neighboring regional states that, that you saw on, on, on the map there. It was an arrangement that was meant to last all of two years. And in, the, in Clapp's eyes and in the eyes of the people who inaugurated this regime, it was going to last two years. By 1952, it would be done. Um, and so in the book, I take these camps as sites of knowledge. Not as, a, not as a sociology, I'm not trying to do a sociology of a particular camp, and I'm not really doing an ethnography of encamped refugees in, in any sense. What I'm interested in is how you can tell this history by telling the history of the camp as a political object, right? Um, so it's something, if, if, you know, if I can go so far, it's something like a conceptual historical archaeology of the camps. To kind of trace these layers in the camps' built environments as as the, across these uh, archives and practices, right? To track how the camp has been conceived, how it's been planned, how it's been regulated, uh, how it's been built, uh, how it's been demolished and targeted, how it's been defended and valorized. Um, so it's at, at one level, it's both a kind of archive of the of the camps, right? building an archive of the camps from these different archival sites. And it's also the camp as a kind of archive in its, in its, own, uh, in its own sense. So each chapter uh, tracks the place of the camp in a, in a particular archive, and it follows it. In the archives, like I said, of the, of the Tennessee Valley Authority, of the TVA, which is a kind of uh, a prehistory of the camp, a prehistory of the camp that emerges at this very particular intersection of post-war techno developments and a racial reordering of the globe in the wake of the challenge of decolonization and anti-colonial nationalism. But it's also a history that drags with it from the American South and the black question, all of these racializing presuppositions that structure the TVA, right, around idleness and around the corrective effects of work that really kind of get uh, hardwired into the camp regime. Um, in the archives of the UN agency, UNRWA, that, ju that I just talked about, as it consolidated its camp regime in the 1950s and 60s through instruments of urban planning, but around a very particular notion of authority, a notion of what it would call administrative authority that would, in my reading, in, sort of indirectly preempt, maybe even prefigure uh, the wider technocratic turn that would be coming and which sort of finds shape in, in mass encampment today. In the archives of the Palestinian Revolution in the 1970s and 80s uh, and the 1960s, as it sought to transform and overcome the camps as sites of sort of immobilization and discipline into communes of sort of forward insurrectionary movements, right? But also sites of social transformation and all the kind of contradictions that that brought up. And in the archives of the Israeli states in the 70s and 80s, that was haunted by the temporality of that saw in the camps impermanence, uh, its own impermanence, and began to see these as somehow wrapped up together, and began to see a sort of intervention with one as an intervention with the other. So much so that they would spend decades devising plans and interventions that were all about the complete undoing of the camps. And I want, in the time that's left, I have no idea how I'm doing for time. Uh, I'm good, okay. Um, I want to share a fragment from this last chapter um, about the, the, the camps in uh, the Israeli archive and the camps in, the, in these projects. Um, in that chapter, I look at this sort of 20-year period between 1967 and 
87, more or less, in which the camps, especially the camps in Gaza, become these sites of repeated state planning and intervention. Right? They were all aimed one way or another at undoing the camps, if you want, at decamping the camps. Um, here's a list of some of these. The, these extend to refugee resettlement before. They come into for control of the camps in the West Bank and Gaza, but they will extend into it. Um, and really, there are practices and interventions that range across a, a, an incredible variety of modalities and logics. Right? Um, it ranges from uh, massive town planning and employment schemes that would resettle tens of thousands of refugees at the same time, to uh, camp improvement and municipal incorporation. Can we improve the camps to a degree and incorporate them into neighboring municipalities such that they would stop being camps? To housing projects for refugee resettlement, right? these folk housing projects uh, that the public, that the military government's public works uh, department spent decades working on in the, 19, in the 1970s, especially, that would see the rehousing of uh, refugees, of encamped refugees in these sort of settlement, in these new housing projects, sometimes just a few hundred yards outside of the campus. Um, and in the end, of course, the most salient modality, um, wholesale camp demolition and clearance. What was uh, often, what often went under the guise of counterinsurgency. And these practices ran consistently. It wasn't, you know, refugee resettlement and camp undoing wasn't a minor policy. It was, it was really something that every government in this period took a stab at, one way or another. So much so that a minister for refugee, minister without portfolio in that period was more or less open code for minister of refugee resettlement. So it was really kind of a, a very persistent uh, practice that involved a host of uh, governmental bodies research institutes, the RAND Corporation at one point, um, global architects, all, all kinds of figures come, come into it. But in the chapter, I, I, I begin by asking, what was it about the camps that makes them such sites of persistent intervention? Even a kind of palpable anxiety, I would, I would argue, for, for Israel's political plans. And we know that uh, refugee return is the sort of uh, the political anathema of state lands, right? It's a kind of master haunting of the state. But the vast majority of Palestinian refugees live outside the camps. There's a small proportion that live inside the camps. So the question for me became, what is it about the camps? What is it about the camps that sort of concentrates and multiplies this threat? What is it about the camps, qua camps? That means so much energy has to be invested in undoing them. Like I said, sometimes just moving people a few hundred, a few hundred yards away. By way of an answer, uh, we can take these near identical statements. One by an ostensibly left-wing Israeli politician, Yoav in 1972, who from the ranks of the opposition proposed the plan for the complete um, removal of all camp inhabitants in, in the West Bank and Gaza, everyone. And, um, and one by an ostensibly left-wing Israeli journalist, two decades later, as he writes in this um, much praised I would say tellingly titled book. It's also a terribly written book, but you know, that was my, my pain to suffer. Um, <laughs> both, both identify the camps and their inhabitants as the hardcore of the problem. And both get to the camps not just as an unruly space, but I think very tellingly as an unruly political temporality, as the very consciousness of an unruly time. For Zakin, as the consciousness of, be, of, of, of being temporary, and uh, sorry, for uh, and the consciousness, uh, the consciousness of exile, for Rubinstein. We see this exact insight, I think, in a certain sense, uh, in these statements made by Israeli officials to the Times of London in 1971. This was at the height of the camp demolition and road widening in uh, Rafah and Jabalia camps. One army commander tells the reporter, and that's the quote up top there, one army ca uh, commander tells the reporter that the security roads being bulldozed through Jabalia camp go straight through the cities of Lidda, Yaffa, and Haifa. The cities of Lidda, Yaffa, and Haifa are the depopulated cities in historic Palestine. Um, clearing the camps in the Second World, clearing the camps and resettling their inhabitants, another official will tell the same reporter, 
little bit later on in the article, had the purpose of what he calls re-education. Re-education for the refugees. It was meant to, as he'll say, teach them to wake up to 1971. To teach them to wake up to 1971. And I think this, for me, was very striking. And I think goes to the heart of everything that, that is at stake here. Um, for one, clearing the camps is a completion of the conquests. In a certain sense, and the defense minister, a year later, would make a near identical statement to the Jerusalem Post. But in a certain sense, without conquering the camp, you haven't really conquered the city. It's an extension and a completion of that conquest, which remains incomplete at some level without this. But it is also a temporal corrective. It's a temporal corrective that works at the very level of subjectivity. Yes? Um, the, the demand to return which is what it's really getting at. The demand to return is here figured as a sort of irrational dream, mm -hmm. as it often is, a kind of illusion. And you have to teach them to wake up and wake you up from your dream slumber. Um, but it is also a means of educating the dispossessed as to their proper place in time, because they are out of sync with time. If you remember, if you recall from this quote, which I didn't really we really relate to you, but he will say here it's it's as if though it's as if as though the present is of no import to them. They don't live in the present. And here the answer is well, if they don't live in the present, the answer is demolishing the camp and settling them somewhere else. Right? And to do that, you really you know to bring them into into line with the present as reality, you have to undo the camp. Because the camp is recognized here, and I think correctly, it's recognized correctly as a site of counter-temporality. It's something that refuses inclusion into, into, the, into dominant time. And so demolition resettlement is sort of what brings you back into, the, into correct time. Um, and so here the camp, I think, doesn't simply mark this unruly, recalcitrant time. It is this time at some level, and that's what I want to get at. Again, it is this unruly time. Um, this time that will not and cannot pass, this time before history, if, if, if you will. Um, and as a final remark, I, I, I want to say that we can see this unruly, this fugitive time that exists, I think, beneath, beyond, but all around settler order in a host of Palestinian political practices and what I would think of as, as forms of refusal. Um, in and out of the camps. I mean, I'm, I'm focusing on the camps here because I think they tell the story. But we can see it beyond the camps. We can see it in the politics of memory. We can see it in the politics of memorialization. We can see it in the insistence on place names and a certain geography of knowledge that people reproduce. We can see it in the cultivation of native wildlife, right? The replanting of forms of wildlife that were on the brink of extinction. We can see it in the practices of return, the actual practices of return, the way people go back to vanquished villages and re-inhabit them, right? And have established, re-established lived relationships to them. Um, we can also see it, I think, in ways that are, that are sort of very present today um, in the relationship to the ruin, right? And the relationship to the contemporary ruin. Uh, in the way there is, uh, in the way people uh, sort of inhabit and rebuild ruins. Right, the way they inhabit and rebuild demolished structures. Um, I think in all of these, in all of these, the, mm -hmm. there is not just a, a form of endurance. There is not just a, a kind of insistence on life in the face of mass death. I think there is also the refusal to consider the settler state as anything more than temporary. There is a kind of cultivation of an alternate time, like I said, beneath, beyond, but all around this order. Um, and that is, that is the stance that I'm trying to get at. And that is the political stance that I'm trying to get at in, in, in this book. And I think the secret, and this is the final thing I'll say, I think the secret of this power, and it is a kind of power, I think, the secret of this power is not in any decisive finality. I think the secret of this power, of these forms of life and refusal, is, is in how they keep time unsettled. Thank you very much for listening.
No, no, no. Okay. Oh, but I've now turned on blue screen. Here, give it to me. I'll just. Does anyone know how to turn it off? Summer, do you know how to turn it off? No. Do you know how to turn off? I think there's something. Yeah. Oh, Brianna's gone. Oh, right. Yeah, we're all like a room full of activists. Can't do anything. Do you need me to turn this off? I just. Yeah. Unless you're going to use me. No. You start and I will. Uh, well, I'm just by you know, I actually, um, it struck me when I was thinking about this that this is the last event of your mm -hmm. sequence, uh, Samurai, you and Natalia and Brianna and so forth. And I, I, I wanted to thank you all, the three of you in particular, for this sequence. You know, like it's, it's actually been, it's been really important to all of us. It's been important through the pandemic. Uh, it's been a really important space of. You know, thinking critically and kind of imagining global critical theory and a different kind of it's been it's been moving and important and it's and the shift to thinking about Palestine through it also has been really important and having Nasser as the the, the the final event in this. So you know it's been it's been great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And now, Um, particular excitement to respond to Nasser's book. I'm about, I've been a huge fan of Nasser's work ever since I encountered it, and uh, the book has. I've had the pleasure of sitting with the manuscript over spring break, and uh, and it hasn't uh, let me down. It's the time beneath the concrete cramped colony Palestine. It's an erudite reckoning with the spatial history of Palestine. A recasting of the question of politics at this time. Um, it's going to be necessary reading in general, I think. Um, right, so I'm going to stay with the, the text a bit more. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book opens with what seems to be a transparent argument. To read the question of Palestine, we have to read the camp. The camp is the issue. al Bukhayam huwa al Qadir. This statement repeated in refugee camps, it is itself prismatic. al qadia the question, issue, cause, indexes what it means to attend to the question of Palestine. It does not simply speak its truth. It can signify general, albeit differentiated, condition of encampment, um, a sense that, um, I suppose that all Palestinians are encamp encamped one way or another. But it can also point to differentiated experiences of the permanent temporariness of camp time, permanent temporariness in tense relation with a larger voluntary encampment, the settler colony itself. Reading the question of Palestine through the statement that camp is the issue requires attending to the endurance of colonial dispossession and violence through, well, through many returns of foundational settler violence and deferral of Palestinian statehood. This, this, this line of thought through endurance and deferral takes us to his central argument with the concern with struggles over land and space as also over time. You just heard that. On the one hand, Israeli settler colonialism is mired in foundational violence. On the other hand, Palestinian struggle denies the closure of settler futurity. As Nasser puts it, Palestinian refusal impinges, impinges on settler time, surrounds it smuggles its fugitive temporalities beneath and above it, and all the while, and with every passing day, chipping away at the order's certainties while keeping the question a question. This is just the opening section, a reading of the statement, the camp is the issue, but it gives you a sense of the uh, glimpse of the careful form of argument. I, I should confess that I, I, you probably realize uh, that I, I'm not a scholar of Palestine. I respond as a student of camps, dispossession, settlement, colonial violence, fantasies of fixing subject uh, people in urban space, only to find their forms of refusal taking new form. With South Africa's 20th century in mind, I read in Abu Rami's manuscript a different way of thinking of processes and politics than, that rhyme in surprising ways with Palestine, without the consolation of ideal forms, uh, idealized forms of comparison of apartheid here, there, everywhere. 
What I'd like to do is to draw out some key moments in the argument to mark some of the ways in which they rhyme in a South African key. I'd like to think that this has been the reason for the hopes of popular solidarity across what remains, what remains of these iconic national liberation struggles. And that's actually what's behind the, you know, Adu Hasim standing up and speaking in that eloquent, eloquent way. Um, Abu Rami's book demonstrates political opening and foreclosure, both of which I think remain in different ways beneath the concrete. Uh, but so far I've said not, uh, something about the arguments about time, but not yet about the concrete. Something about the spatial, material, and I think earthly history of camps reckon with the politics of settler time, de denying its fruition. And I'll ha I highlight a few key moments as I read, uh, read in the text. So first, there's an early 20th century movement, uh, moment, which, in which uh, uh, British Zionist uh, Israel Zangwill shift, in which he shifts his position from Palestine as a wilderness in 1901 to one in which by 1921 uh, he poses as Palestine as, in his words, not so much occupied by the Arabs as overrun by them. They are nomads whose presence implies at best Arab encampment. This appearance of the camp at first, Abdurami characterizes as placeless form, an image in negation of the mysticism surrounding the Zionist Yishuv settlement or territory. To settle with this formulation would be to miss the, that the camp has accompanied the long history of Zionist colonialism. It has been, as Abraham puts it, it's overlapping accomplice, um, but simply both British and Zionist colonization relied on a variety of camp forms, forms that brought together a flexible mixture of penal, carceral, extractive labor, exploitative, demographic, and, and territorial logics. Kibbutzim drew from German agricultural colonies, wall and stockade formations of the Great Revolt of the 1936-39, the British mandates prison labor camps, foreshadowed Zionist labor camps of 1948, post-Nakba absorption camps, Palestinian refugee camps. And Stolo frames the camp and colony in deadly embrace in a conjoined conceptual matrix that admits differentiation and filiation. Abu Rami, I think, makes a sharper case for their specific entanglement in the inability of the Zionist project to resolve the opposition of settler and native. The argument is reminiscent of the Fanon's dramatization of colonial space cut in two, directly clarifying political stakes today. I'll conclude to a more specific argument about the provenance of this Fanonian argument I, I, that I, as I read it. The South African question also rested on how to diagnose the lasting effects of a relation between camp and colony. The camps in question were British concentration camps of the dawn of the 20th century, sites of imperial humanitarian rescue of Afrikaner women and children in a war of attrition against Afrikaner guerrillas. The very name Afrikaner, which means African, is an audacious settler claim to attachment in Southern Africa. The most influential historiographic accounts of the origins of apartheid spatial forms pose the te political technologies honed in the concentration camps at the beginning of the 20th century and in mig migrant labor camps as providing the spatial archetypes that culminated in apartheid's generalized apparatus of racial spatial uh, planning. Most more recent work returns to the forms of expertise with less teleological certainty specifically biopolitical expertise in public health and town planning that mediated hopes of racial and spatial containment while displacing struggles to the terrain of the biopolitical. And now there's substantial work on networks of progressivist expertise across settler colonies that sought to use these biopolitical tools differently, quite often cutting the body politic, at several enthusiasts for progressivism and segregation in early 20th South Africa, were also early supporters of Zionism, from architects of municipal self-government to urban segregation to pioneering figures in social medicine who left the landscape I worked on in the onset of apartheid in 1948, and they went to Israel. Um, when South Africa's National Party came to power in, in 1948, it had to substantiate what it actually meant by apartheid, but it did not pursue anything like the Nakba. Instead, it continued long-standing processes of expulsion and resettlement using law and planning, 
twisting the discourses of development and decolonization. For its adversaries, the long, slow process of dispossession kept the land question alive, but nothing like a Palestinian politics of return. While the history of the Anglo-Boer War, Boer War camp was not exactly writ large over the, across the century, the forms of biopolitical expertise brought to bear on subject populations through it has cast a long shadow at disciplining refusal. Thinking in parallax, what is striking is that the Palestinian refugee camp as a socio-technical object could not quite diffuse an insurgent political will, but rather kept the politics of Palestine and of return alive. Um, this takes me to Abiramie's account of the socio-technical history of the camp, but hinged on the UN um, Relief and Works Agency, tasked with building, administering, providing services to refugee camps. And we saw in the fascinating twist, TVA, the TVA's Gordon Clapp has this mission that uh, allowed the Israeli state not so much to face the recent violence of the Nakba, to, but to defer the anxieties of settlerness through the socio-technical discourse of planning, or perhaps to disclose through effacement of the violence of the Nakba and pass a voice description of crumbling economic life. Mm. The workings of the technical committee resonate with the South African state's attempts at biopolitical territoriality in the 1930s and 40s, when the, the tools of statistical certitude, the census, the survey, were quickly set aside because biopolitics in the settler colony had no need to seek consent from most of the government. But the new Israeli states turned to technical apparatuses chilling yeah, because it is in the immediate, immediate wake of the Nakba. The ideological response seems to pull out all the stops in its references. There's a palimpsestic quality to official discourse. It draws from the segregated US South, from various iterations of late Victorian liberal intervention and reform in a seemingly impossible task of recasting Palestinian refugee camps as temporary sites for a return to work and permanent resettlement of some kind, but not return. The integrated approach of the TVA is brought on to this seemingly impossible task. But as Abu Ramin argues, there is no transformation of refugees into a regional labor force through settlement, no mass work projects of the scale necessary, uh, but rather a long-term legacy of segregated super exploitation and precarious under underemployment that is the long-term legacy. The agency by 1950 defined the refugee as a needy person who, as a result of the war in Palestine, had lost his home and his means of livelihood. What this is premised on is an erasure of Palestinian belonging, naturalization of expulsion through techno technical technocratic apparatus, spanning a network of camp, a network of camps across five different national jurisdictions with a variety of social and spatial conditions. The agency sought to use spatial form to control to contain revolt but it was haunted by the possibility that the camps would also become breeding grounds for revolt. Reminiscences of camp residents demonstrate refusal of refugee camps as permanent and also the possibility of resettlement farther from Palestine. In a memorable, a memorable moment, a woman stands against the agency's housing scheme. She says, we shall build only when we return to our land. There we shall build. So inhabiting camp became, camps became a complex political problem for Palestinian refugees, which had implications for the materiality of habitation under course, uh, conditions of forced irresolution. So this question of materiality becomes even more uh, kind of uh, fine-grained. But it is important. Uh, uh, it was much easier to smuggle gun easier to smuggle guns than cement. Uh, Rami tells us into camps in Lebanon in the 60s, zinc and tin roofs exacerbated the vindictive atmosphere of camp life. A specific problem of the camp was coming into relief. The camps were becoming, in Abrami's words, the spatial effects of the engineered political irresolvability of the question of Palestine, caught between Israeli expulsion, refusal of return, as well as of resettlement in neighboring uh, Arab states. Camps became a contradictory space that indexed the question of Palestine. The agency tries to deal with this unresolvability built by building model villages, by imagining mega planning forms like the TBA that never materialized. In the 60s, it imagined comprehensive planning. In a way, this kind of profusion of planning forms. Mm. 
uh, that, that uh, without clarity in, about boundaries, that these coercive forms of attempted biopolitical territorialization also rhyme with South African apartheid, but with two major exceptions. The first is that Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza unveiled the agency's authority over camps and its relation to Israeli military occupation. Housing construction now became a literal battlefield as the Israeli army demolished homes and imprisoned people who built outside the camps, outside the administrative reach of the agency. This is a moment in the text in which Abraham engages the agency's attempts at articulating authority and sovereignty. But can we not, there's a question to you, but can we not see this as the, the agency's attempts at harnessing the tools of biopolitics precisely to mediate sovereign territorial and extraterritorial power on behalf of the Israeli state after all the Israeli military enters when necessary. The second thing that is distinctive, I think, was the post Cairo Accord entrance of the PLO, the Lebanon's camp, or the, uh, the advent of the Palestinian Revolution, 1968 to 1982, centered on the, in your words, the historical dilemma of forming a militant subject from the encamped refugee. And there's a wonderful chap, rich chapter in which um, Amirami reads through a set of novels from uh, Kanafani, Abu Shawir, and Yaklif to show how the Palestinian revolution was a revolution from and against the champs, the camps. The camps were a base in the sense of the armed struggle, also a site for the invention of a new form of revolutionary time. And through the novels, uh, we see how the camp form and novel, novel form entangled to reveal the limits of uh, revolution focused on sovereignty. This is my favorite part of the book. You thought it was the next chapter, but it was this one. <laughs> the way in which Abu Rami's focus on the camp sticks as to what he calls the creation of revolutionary space-time that is forgotten in the focus on the armed struggle. This is the Palestinian commune he's written so evocatively about. There's a lot to think about the novel form um, written as reckoning with what you call the stubborn object of, of thought and action that is the camp a place that marks the return to a place to come. That is a, bears rethinking this, a place that marks the return of a place to come, a different Palestine. It is forged through an earthliness, that, this is what I read, it forged through an earthliness that survives the terrible, violent, unfinishedness of camp life in the mother of the militant in Kanafani's novella, Um Saad, who sees directly beneath the flooded, muddy conditions of camp life after the heavy rains or the heavy atmosphere, sweaty bodies, sandstorms, flash floods, hot asphalt beneath the feet, coughing children in an agency school in Abu Shawir's uh, Alushak. The elemental and earthly life that survives and motivates militant politics is also an earthliness that is beneath the concrete, even in terrible times in which it is reduced to rubble. These novels appear to have a didactic value and their, their focus on the subject of militancy but I wonder if Abu has found a way to read them below the concrete, also for a different politics of return that is not centered on sovereignty. I would, I would like to just add it try it centered on earthliness. Mm. Another figure in Al Ushak, Um Hassan, a comrade's mother, patiently forms mud bricks under the hot sun. A figure forms mud, mud bricks under the hot sun. A figure of earthly transformation which is also a political figure if we think with the earthly time beneath the concrete. And that's another question to you. The apparently unheroic, apolitical part of the ordinariness of camp life, it's not quite steadfastness or some of you argue. You call it necessary scaffolding of heroism. But can you think more about what this means, this earthly work of maintaining the means of resistance, uh, also, a way of maintaining a politics of return under conditions of protracted temporariness uh, and genocidal war. Um, does this also survive the critique of the Palestinian revolution as failure? I ask because it, it rhymes directly with what I think of as the South African commune of the 70s that was not directed by the liberation movements, the ANC, the South African Communist Party. It was. It, but by its most radical worker, feminist, communitarian critics, um, there's a similar question that survives, a different conception of becoming revolutionary, as you put it, antagonistic to sovereignty, but I would also add antagonistic to capital. Um, there's a question of capital in all this around the why this is not a crisis, in a way, 
war is not a crisis for capital. It's probably a bonanza for capital. Mm. It's part of the issue. Mm. In the following decades, the camp continues to be a threat for its promise of insurgent refusal and fundamentally the possibility of return, as you put it, the political anathema of state Zionism, it's master haunting. Um, Abirami traces the many forms of settler negation, but also the way in which they are materialized in the production of engineered landscapes, uh, particularly in relation to the long counterinsurgency in Gaza. The idea of comprehensive regional planning recurs. It starts out with never dies, mm -hmm. keeps coming back. But attempts at settler erasure through architectural design conserves something of Palestinian life that cannot be repressed. The camps were undone through demolition and improvement, through the lure of private home ownership. Uh, as long as people demolish their camps, uh, their home, their camp homes. But all the while, the question of Palestinian return has remained. Uh, at a telling moment, an Israeli anthropologist notes settlements have started looking more like urban working class neighborhoods, but he noticed with frustration that people still consider themselves refugees. Palestinian political practice, uh, in, Palestine, in Palestinian political practice, al Alistania. 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 keeps things unsettled. It refuses settlement on settler terms. It is the commitment to rebuild in the face of temporariness and destruction. It is a practice of indigenous refusal. This political practice seems to be, as I read it, at the heart of what you call incommensurate, incommensurate time beyond or beneath the project of settlement, the time beneath the concrete. And I think that's the, what it lies behind the statement, your statement, to insist on Palestine as this viable, still existing, recoverable place, insist, is to insist not only on what is beneath the forests and housing complexes of colonial erasure, but what is beneath their present as well, that is beneath the temporal order settlement both relies on and constitutes and you conclude Israel's temporal and thus is as a settler project isn't a failure, it's a defeat. And this is my final point. I wonder what you think of this reading, that to see this defeat, we have to follow Abu Rami in the text as he pierces the fear and loathing of camp people, the fear of those who will, who will pay with life and limb before anything else, and those who are therefore unwilling to forego insurgency this is a point I want to return to. This is where I want to return to that finite, finite aspect of the argument. The colonial relation is sharpened precisely here in the spaces that experienced the ongoing colonial violence and a reminder of the always unfinished work of repression. And there are a couple of questions that emerge from this. Does this mean that the technical sublation of the colonial relation in, for instance, in restricting sovereignty has also failed? And if so, can we think of the Palestinian revolution beyond failure and defeat mm -hmm. while the camp remains the issue? Mm -hmm. And I've asked this already, but are there not other revolutionary times beneath the concrete, the woman, woman making the mud brick in the sun, admonishing the world, and also standing as more than the mother of the insurgent? Mm -hmm. I wanted you to reflect on her uh, relation to another politics beneath the concrete. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like me to take a question, or you want to take a question? Uh, no. Okay. I can do it. I don't set up. Yeah. Questions. Please. Uh, is there a mic? Or? No. Yeah. Where are my place? Uh, I wonder if the uh, refugee camps serve as a coercive purpose to. Uh, make certain Palestinian behaviors who are not in the refugee camps, as an example of what might happen to them if they don't behave the way the settlers, to some degree or another, to cooperate, mm -hmm. in addition to the financial mm -hmm. incentives and so on. The other one is, do the camps serve as a kind of caste system for the Palestinians? In other words, you're not in the, as I understand it from the caste system, there's somebody below you, which makes you safer from the bottom, the existence of living at the bottom. Mm -hmm. 
And then also, the camps seem to be a kind of model of ghettos that the Jews lived with for so many centuries. So that might be one of the reasons, you know, psychologically why they maintain these camps. And then the, the ability to take them down and put them up and move them around and all these exercise of power demonstrations. Yeah, it must be also if you want to respond to Sharon's question. Yes, yes, right? yes, I can. Sorry, I forgot to invite <laughs> you. I follow your you lead. Can, yeah, yeah, you'll follow you. <laughs> you'll lead that. So. <laughs> my turn? <laughs> <laughs> as long as you tell me it's my turn. Um, uh, <coughs> so much. I'm really thank you for that. That's incredible. Really, um, my work always so, sounds so much better when people read it back to me. No, it doesn't. You, you're, I do that. Did I say that? Uh, let, me, let me maybe start with your question. Uh, thank you for it. And then I will try to at least tie it into part of what I'm uh, thinking. And this is all on the fly, so you just have to bear with me. Um, uh, the camp as you know, a, a kind of demonstrated, a side of what I, as I understood it, a side of demonstrative violence. And yes, the camps, uh, and Shara, Shara gets at this a little bit with, you know, he talks about those, those who will lose life and limb before everyone else. And yes, the camps are, you know, they occupy this very sort of privileged space in the, the national economy of science in Palestine, right? They have a kind of privileged uh, space, but really that, that, that's often a, a very symbolic space. And when push comes to shove, it is they who, who are been at the forefront of insurgency, and it is they who bear the brunt of, of colonial violence. It's always been that case. I mean, I, you know, to, to, to get a little, a little autobiographical for a second, one of the, one of the reasons I, I begin thinking about the camps, I think, is that I grew up, I grew up in, I grew up in East Jerusalem. And I grew up in East Jerusalem, not too far from a camp, actually. It's pretty close to where we live. And I grew up in a, at a time, East Jerusalem, not to, not to age myself entirely, in the 90s, when, um, when there was this veneer of a peace process, and really the refugees in the camps were the big losers of this geopolitical restructuring of the occupation. Um, but I grew up, like a lot of people uh, in, in that part of the world, and a lot of Palestinians, on stories of the camp, right? The stories of the sacrifice, the stories of the siege, the violence, Tel Satar. Sabra and Shakila, they were very kind of ev evocative places. I remember one time as a teenager, my mother telling me when I, um, when I wasn't doing my homework, which was often the case, and she told me one time, I must have been 12 or 13, she told me, you know, right now in the camps, they're doing their homework under the street lights, right? under the lights of the street lights, they're not electricity in their house, which was probably dated by then, it's probably not true. But anyway, this was a kind of, almost a folkloric thing that she repeated. And I thought, oh, I thought, wow, that's you know, what new torture is this? I mean, homework under streetlight, I mean, it was terrifying, of course. But they occupied this place. I mean, we talked about them, but we really didn't have contact with the camps. You know, they kind of lived. They later I did, but that lived daily life was remote, even for even for people like me in East Jerusalem, which I know I didn't live far from Shafat. But, you know, so. um, so there is absolutely the case that you know they've both, both borne the brunt of this violence, um, but have occupied this sort of symbolic place, and there is a kind of disjuncture in that. In so maybe that is a kind of caste system in the sense that you that you talk about it. What it definitely has become in the last twenty years is a class system. Class, they are classed in a different way, and they're they're. It's not just that they're classed in a different way. It's also that as these things got restructured in the in the in the nineties and the and the early parts of this century. They sort of became impediments to the larger class project in the in the occupied countries, um, and so they became a kind of an obstacle to the sort of I don't want to use the word neoliberal because it's too but the sort of neoliberal economic restructuring of the territories in which there would be a kind of economic pacification, a new class of sort of um, uh, elite uh, elite figures that would man manage the system in which the, the camps really had no no place. Um, and in that sense, they have been ghettoized in a sort of, if you want, in an American parlance, I'm using that in quotations, um, but also they've always been ghettoized in that older sort of European sense, right? Because they've always been the, the site of a sort of racial surplus, 
been the site of a racial surplus that is really inassimilable. It cannot be assimilated into anything. Right? I mean, so they've always uh, been immunological sites, right? Sites treated through sort of immunological politics. And you can see that very clearly. Did you feel lucky? Um, we might sorry, have uh, time for oh, yeah. follow-ups oh, later. Yeah. Later, we'll check. We'll check. <laughs> we'll check. Um, I think that, you know, at, at that point, there is a kind of time. I'm just going to pick up on one of uh, Jared's questions. And I, I will try to get to the right. But um, this sense of the biopolitical and, you know, where the biopolitical collapses um, with the camps. The camps is very clearly at some point, yes, biopolitical and disciplinary. They, they have both those logics of, of power, I think, are at play. And, uh, you know, he, he says that one of the differences uh, is, the, is the occupation and the sort of limits of the biopolitical within the, and I think that's that's correct and you know um, we are at a stage now where uh, the Israeli state wants to dissolve UNRWA entirely right this has now become a sort of strategic imperative for the Israeli state but it wasn't always the case when they occupied the West Bank and Gaza in fact they they created a very real modus vivendi with UNRWA and with the agency because they relied on UNRWA as a biopolitical Formation, right? Who's going to feed and house and educate these people? They didn't want anything to do with it. But very quickly, the, the, you know, the, the, the other logics that are at play that completely overwhelm Israeli biopolitics and the occupied territory, right? They're overwhelmed very quickly, which is the necropolitical and the settler, really, right? The, the, the drive to elimination completely overwhelms the biopolitical. And so they, 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 the, the, the relationship breaks down very quickly, right? And they begin to, to, to sort of push back on UNRWA's uh, statuses, right, or its immunities and its privileges, um, and there is really no horizon in which the refugees are biopolitically managed by anyone, really, by by the Israeli state, or in which they would become. And, and I and I think here is where we can think in that key in those that, that rhyming with the South African case, in which they would become uh, a sort of biopolitically managed labor force. They are, they are super exploited, but they are first and foremost an expendable impediment to the project. Which is not to say that they're, and I think that, you know, what's interesting, what's interesting about thinking about these camps now in a wider sort of global sense, and the way they sort of prefigure things that are happening today, especially around mass encampments, is that they prefigure, they prefigure these logics that are emerging at the time that are really prefigured in Palestine that will become much more uh, generalized, right? One is what we were just talking about in terms of the ghetto, which is a racial surplus to, uh, to a body politic. And of course, they're not the only ones. What they, how they stand out is the intractability of that surplus, right? the durability of their encampment, which is also something that gets generalized now, right? We are in an age where mass encampment is uh, not just mass, but it's long term. But the other, the other sort of line that I see that gets prefigured is precisely in their disposability and surplus to the needs of formal labor. Right? If we go to the question of the here capital and the biopolitical, they are certain. They are certain. There's no horizon in which they become workers. Right? Those projects as, as socio-technical devices for that transformation collapse. They don't become workers. They become a kind of uh, Disposable surplus. They can be super exploited, but really they're disposable. They're expendable. They're kind of detritus, to rip up one of your terms. Um, they're kind of detritus, and I think that prefigures something that we also see in, intersecting today with with the uh, with the racial question, with, with what I understand as the kind of cohabitation question, which is that becomes generalized in late capitalism, right? This becomes a kind of generalized phenomenon in which. The, what we used to think of as a sort of relative surplus population becomes increasingly absolute on a mass scale. People become surplus in a different sense now. They become surplus in an absolute sense in that there is no horizon in which they will be absorbed as a reserve army of labor in any sense, right? That disposability, again, is not, I think, I don't think it's external to value, right? Because there, there is value to be made in the disposability of people, in their disposing, in their wasting. But I think, uh, you know, if the, if the biopolitical moment collapses, it collapses along these two axes, cohabitation and race, and surplus and disposability. Uh, and I think both of these are at, at really at the core of the border crisis today.
core of mass encampment, the phenomenon of mass encampment theory, um, in a very generalized sense. And that's the coda of the book. It is, yes. <laughs> if you want to know more about that, Yeah, I mean, I'm going to ask a question. Let's see if there are other questions. Um, thank you so much, Mr. I really enjoyed hearing about this work. Um, I have two maybe somewhat unrelated questions. Uh, the first one is kind of about your engagement with the TBA as kind of pre history of the camp. Um, my dad is from Palestine, he's worked with the TBA for 40 years. So, also just on a personal level, this is something that I would just love to hear a little bit more about and how you're engaging that history of the TBA. Mm -hmm. Um, and secondly, I have a question about Harith Katz's book, um, The Common Camp, mm. and sort of how some of the arguments you're employing in your text are either critiquing in conversation with doing something slightly different from the approach you're using in her book. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of an implication maybe speaking about some of those differences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Should we take more questions or should I ask? What would you prefer? No, oh, you're the boss, you tell me. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So um, thank you. Thank you. The, the, the TVA and the prehistory of the camps. Um, I think there are two, for me, there were two main things at stake in that chapter. First, that uh, it, it, there's an important shift in how we understand where this camp regime emerges from. There is a, there is an assumption that it, it emerges out of this humanitarian, post-war humanitarian moment. Um, every book that I read on the camps, on this camp regime, on this institution, sort of assumes that. Although they all start by gesturing to CLAP and the TVA, as if sort of just gesture. They say, there's this guy, he came, he survey mission, they did this work for a few few months, and then they inaugurated this regime, but no one, no one delves deeper than that. But actually, what I, I, I wanted to get at is that uh, there's a prehistory there that is not really about humanitarianism per se. It will intersect with humanitarianism, but the, the, the resolution that inaugurates the camp regime happens two years before, before the UN Convention on the Protection of Refugees. And really it emerges at a sort of techno-developmental moment in the post-war order. And the TBA is really fashioned in, in that sense as a way of not just projecting American power, but really managing the fallout of a world that is rapidly undergoing decolonization, the rise of anti-colonial nationalism, and the threat of Soviet communism. And the TVA becomes a certain name for dealing with that and shoring up the hierarchies that now were on the verge of becoming sort of extinct uh, through another means. Right? You could not rely on the same uh, sort of discourse and logics that had structured say the, the League of Nations and the mandate system or the direct sort of colonial era before that, it had to be packaged differently. And it was gonna be packaged now uh, through technical expertise, through technical assistance, through technical hierarchies, this notion of the technical that does a lot of work, um, and this sort of imperative of a will to work, this sort of getting people to work somehow. Um, and I say the camp emerges out of, in part out of that moment but then I say that there is something else that gets missed in the story, which is that TVA comes from its, its own sort of history. It comes out of this context of the segregated American South, and it brings with it a whole bunch of, and what I saw is a whole bunch of racializing presuppositions about how, what its work, what it's going to do. And those have to do with idleness, which is a concept that just is all over there, that, that archive and the, and, and the, and the documents. And a, and a notion of, of, of a corrective work, right? Work as rehabilitative, work as what is needed for people that are not quite ready for self-government or self-management. Um, and there are these incredible sort of then resonances, right, between the, the way the black question was thought of through the TVA, which was this overwhelming, huge organization here, and the way the Palestinian question was then sort of treated in the, uh, in, in, the in, in the camp regime that was inaugurated, right? And um, so for example, the then head of the TVA before CLAP, Arthur Morgan, I think in 1936 is asked, is, you know, there's a, the NAACP are launching a pretty broad critique of the, of the TVA, which they're, they've sort of figured, they've characterized as what they call a lily white reconstruction, right? referring to the anti-black branch of the Republican Party to say, it's not just the sort of economic extension of the failure of re reconstruction, which would be bad enough, it's also it's an inversion of reconstruction. It's an anti-black reconstruction. 
And Arthur Morgan replies, you know, in I think terms that are still with us, that um, well, the blacks, as he says it, are going to have to learn to work for themselves. It's almost verbatim. Two years later, not two years later, sorry, a decade or so later, when Clapp goes to the region, when he goes to the Arab world, and he writes this report, and he inaugurates this regime, and people tell him, he's not really coming to terms with the political questions that the refugees are facing. He says, well, they have to learn to work for themselves. When this discourse stays, right? In the book, I, I gesture a bit unfairly on Clapp because I compare him to Jared Kushner. Um, <laughs> Clapp is an infinitely more decent human being than Jared Kushner. I want that on the record. But nonetheless, <laughs> what Kushner says in 2020, during the George Floyd uprising, he says, well, my father-in-law can't help black people take the opportunities that are there. And then I think like a year or later or before when he is talking about the absurd, absurdly titled deal of the century, he says, you know, this is a deal that's going to be there in the meantime because we're going to work on the economics because the politics are too hard, exactly what the clock mission set out to do. Um, because the Palestinians are not yet quite ready for self-government. So the, like, as, as a kind of, you know, as a kind of discursive and structuring logic, it, it remained. And I think that's, that's what I wanted to dig at with the TDA. It kind of, it, 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 it permeates and it leaves something there. Um, very quickly in terms of Katz, yeah, I think Katz is doing something different in that she's, I don't think she really comes to terms with what I'm interested in, which is the settler colonial fundamentally in its wider, wider iteration. She's interested in and, I, and it's important, and I draw on it, the way the camp form was this very sort of uh, flexible, fungible form um, that really was sort of crucial in the state's foundation and was necessary for dealing with its demographic and territorial transformation. Sure, yes. Um, but I'm trying to get at the, the, the question that really has to do with the nature of the settler colonial project. Thanks. Question? Sure. Um, thank you, Nasser, for writing here very deep and uh, timely uh, presentation. Um, I was thinking about one of the very important points that you make, which is that, you know, part of the political force that you uh, said of the uh, camp is this untimely, or it's a really time, you said. Yeah. Right? And I was wondering if you can extend that, the notion of a really time to the political, demand, the political demand that is made outside the camp of the right of return, mm. and the right of the return as sharing in that. Very mm. you know, powerful, or you know, the claim that is constantly stated, constantly objective, but constantly, mm. uh, uh, you know, is there on the table as part of the emblems of the crisis of the settler colonial project. Mm. It's also like you know, it's interesting to think about it in the sense that you know, the right of the return is, is you know, the idea is it is what puts end to the camp, mm. you know, refugees return, but then it is constant rejection. It's actually what keeps the camp as camp. You know, mm. people refuse that the camp is settled becomes a new city. Is camp, mm -hmm. and you are refugees in the camp until you return. So I'm wondering if that, that mm -hmm. the right to return, how it can be raised by the temporary of the camp outside. This, this will take this, we'll just look like this. <laughs> if I go into this, it's, uh, um, yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to try to do it briefly. Um, I'm going to try to do it briefly. So the camp, uh, so the camp at, a, at a fundamental level, uh, for Palestinians, for the Palestinians that inhabit it, is um, is that which is uh, is that which they will not move out of, where they will hold ground and insist on holding ground, and that which can never become permanent. So it's a kind of way station, or as they call it sometimes, a transit station or a waiting station, that they will hold on to and defend with their lives if need be, but only so that they can one day. Leave. And it's an incredible kind of contradictory stance. Um, and return is central to that. Return, in, in a certain sense, the unruliness of the time and of the consciousness that's built, the temporal consciousness that's produced, is framed by return, by a certain uh, horizon of return. But I think return is, uh, and, and in, in that, that's, you know, again, the, the Shard gets at in terms of um, the return of the repressed here is. Is, is important because the return of the repressed is doubled. It's the return of the repressed literally, physically, and it's the return of the repressed psychically um, in, from, from the viewpoint of, of the state. Um, 
so of course the, 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 the bind is that the state refuses doesn't allow people to return and that keeps the camp a camp and the state wants to undo the camp so that that, her, that potential horizon of return that unruly time will be as they see it mediated um, and that, that that's the uh, kind of in, you know in a certain sense the impossible position that the Israeli state finds itself in with this with this community. and one that it sets out to treat with uh, a sort of you know brute materialism we can undo the camps we can destroy them and this will will negate the temporality you know, to really block the return that we repress um, and it doesn't really work it doesn't really work because there's no amount of there's no amount of brute materialism, there's no amount of clearing, of bulldozing, of resettling that will solve that political historical question. Because it's neither a material question nor a phenomenal question, right? in the sense of, you know, they're also, like many other actors, very concerned with changing the names of these places. So if we resettle people outside, it's very important that this wouldn't be called a camp. It would be called a housing project, a neighborhood, whatever. Um, and of course, that's not what happened. They're often, often claimed by the name of a camp. Right? They became extensions of the camps. So I think that I think the, the the Israeli state understood. That's why I say it. I think they understood correctly much more than the sort of uh, the developmental and humanitarian world the temporal political character of the camps, but they didn't have the instruments to really do it right? to really negate that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask if there are other questions, but maybe let me ask you a question here, um, Nasser. Um, in, because I read the manuscript. In the last chapter of the book, in the Coda, there is something that, you, that, that the chapter on the politics of inhabitation, you open up precisely this question of inhabitation, this question of also being temporary, the temporariness of the camp, I mean, the place you want to, to larger questions, broader questions of encampment globally that is not about Palestine necessarily. Mm -hmm. Can you say a few words about how Palestinian camp are the, is the ground from which we can question, understand mm -hmm. the question of inhabitation mm -hmm. today more generally in mm -hmm. other camps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I was trying to get at a couple of things. One which I've already gestured to, which is this, uh, you know, the, these logics that are prefigured in, in, in the surplus, in the surplus in the people that become absolute, in, in uh, the anxieties of cohabitation that return. But I think, in a way, Palestine, but colonial history, more more broadly prefigured. What, what you know? What is mass encampment today, really? Right? What is mass encampment in the light of, of this massive so-called border crisis? At some level, you know, it's a refusal to cohabit with others. At the very fundamental level, it's a refusal to cohabit with those who do not want to cohabit the earth with. Um, and in that sense, it kind of drags up with it all of these older uh, sort of. Uh, fears of cohabitation, of racial contamination. And I think that those, those have been very much at play in the history of the Palestinian camps, right? in, in, in the different contexts that, 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 they, that they've been in. Um, but then, okay, what do we learn about this history, or how can we read this history in this present if we read it from the, from the Palestinian camps? And part of what I wanted to get away from was the sense that you know, the, the, the camp is a, as a figure is about the state of exception and about all of these sort of, um, you know, kind of critique of the biopolitics of liberal democracy. And I, yeah, I don't like, fundamentally disagree with that. But I, I think its purview is so narrow historically and geographically, it returns to the scene of the European catastrophe again and again, that it's unable to really see what's at stake in mass encampment in this, this moment when the camp as a form has become a totally banal, repetitive uh, technology for the, for the closure of cohabitation, for the containment of, 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 of people everywhere. And what I try to say is that actually what's at stake is something much better thought of in um, the idiom of inhabitation mm -hmm. and the politics of inhabitation. And here I think, as, again, you know, there's a certain way in which the Palestinian camps um, prefigure a certain turn, which is not just in the durability and the seeming permanence, the built upness of these camps now that can house tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people for a long period, but it's also in how people begin to, to inhabit spaces as a form of politics that is premised neither on ownership nor on permanence. 
And I, I think that there's something telling in that, there's something important in that, which is that people are able to make a kind of political claim outside of, outside of most of the sort of normative frameworks we think about, and with a kind of, uh, with a foot in the temporary, right? And the temporary is constantly sort of, you know, uh, mixing uh, the, 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 uh, the forms of settlement up, right? It, it, it's, it's constantly changing what we, how we think of inhabitation. Um, and I think that the sort of Palestinian stance, as, as I understood it, this stance of, um, as I just talked about, inhabiting something only in the meantime, but insisting on inhabiting it as a means to its own, own overcoming, is mirrored. You can see it. I mean, you can see it, in, or fragments of it in important ways. In Calais, you can see it um, outside Sipta and Melilla in Morocco, in uh, the sort of mountain encampments that are, again, demolished and rebuilt over and over and over again, which people will inhabit only as a means to one day leaving, so that they can decide the moment and the means of their passage, of their transit. So I think in, in that sense, right, in, in much broader senses beyond encampment more generally, right, um, in the returning figure of the commune, in sanctuary at its most radical ends, um, in migrant life in cities, you know, what, what's at stake are these modalities of inhabitation that, um, that really are, are about these sort of temporary forms of residing and holding and making political claims. Through, through, through that, without, without permanence, without, without any attachments or ownership. Are there other questions? Yes. Um, you, you emphasize the role of the camp as this return aspiration. Uh, does that mean that people who are not in the camp have, have as much aspiration as those that are in the camp? No, no. Is there some, you know, degree of lessening the further away you are economically, socially from the camp? No, I, I, I don't think so. Return is a sort of a central, I mean, it's a central political demand. It's more than a political demand. I mean, return is also, a, in its, it's a stance, it's a way of being in the world for Palestinians, I think. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not sort of uh, restricted to the camps, and the camps are sort of, uh, are the kind of spatial temporal manifestation of that stance in a certain sense, um, but that stance and that demand is much bigger. It really structures not just Palestinian life, but I think uh, the very capacities of imagining Palestinian futures. And in that sense, it's 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 misunderstood as a demand because it's often seen as a demand for a kind of restoration. Um, it's seen as a sort of desire to go back. And to how things once were, right? Or to, to restore something that once was, it's not, and it's not that at all. Actually, I think I think return is a above all um, about futurity and about virtual futurity in a certain sense, right? It's, it doesn't exist in the realm of the possible; it exists in the realm of, of the virtual, and in 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 in, in a certain sense, it it. Um, uh, it, it is about that future. It is not about a recovery of a past in any meaningful sense. And in, in that sense, when you think about it from the camp, uh, it's not simply the overcoming of the camp, as we tend to think of it, even in Palestinian political discourse. Because what the what return also gestures to in the, in the futurity it imagines is really a world beyond the border regime that has in part produced the camps and produced these states. Right? But it sort of what it, I think it, it incites is a, is a world of circulation in which, yes, the camp plus, the camp plus the village, the camp plus the city, um, not either or, right? Um, I, think, I think that's, that's where, where, there's power, where there's power. Thank you. Nasser, there is a Nasser, another Nasser in the room that would like to ask a question. Of course. <laughs> Nasser, <laughs> Nasser, <laughs> Nasser. <laughs> Nasser. Um, oh, Thank you so much. I, I, I want to follow up on Sarah's question because I think I got lost a little bit in your response, and I just want to understand it better. It may mean that I just need to look at color to understand it. So, um, so in, in returning to the question of what the Palestinian camp suggests for camps more generally, you know, you, you, you turn to the sort of conceptions of the, the temporary, and here set against the, the sort of contradictions of of the of the 
temporalities of the camp, you start losing what the temporary means. But then also more specifically, part of what your emphasis was was the degree to which the temporality of the camps is a counter temporality to the establishment of the history or just the history of the of the of the Israeli state or the Zionist project. Mm -hmm. So then I think what I want to understand better then if that is the model are the is the counter temporality characteristic of these other camps that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Is that the counter temporality that is also kind of marked against the histories that are being mm -hmm. formed? Mm -hmm. Or is it the counter temporality just on the level of some other consumption conception of a temporary? Mm. My question is clear. Yes, I, th I think so. I think so. No, no, I think so. And I, I, I um, you know, that 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 line that I want to draw between the Palestinian form and the contemporary forms of mass encampment, uh, you know, might flatten out some of some of those sort of more fine grained particular texture of, of of the very real differences that also exist. So that 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 I'm not sure how much because they're not contained in the same in the same context. How much the, 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 that that's that uh, sort of feature of the Palestinian camp as a counter temporality exists in the other circuit context because that feature really uh, is bound up with with the settler with the with settler histories right and the establishment of that historical time and in a certain sense it employs uh, it employs time against history if you will right? a certain kind of sense of time against mm -hmm. history. I'm not sure that exists in the other context. What the line that the line that I wanted to draw the connection was how in both there is an, an inhabitation of a kind of temporary temporariness as the as as the site or as the basis or as the ground of a kind of action, which I think is is noteworthy. Which is to say, it's you know it's it's the the, the claims that are made and you know the the. The attempts in these sites to determine when one moves, right, and to insist that I can stay here until we decide we go, and I'm not bound by the permanence of this place, nor am I bound by the, the forces that want to push me out of this place. That I think, as a sort of, I don't know, as a kind of structure, or as a, I try to think of it as a stance, um, that I think is shared. And that I think is 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 a, a sort of challenge to how we think about inhabitation more more broadly. Mm -hmm. It's so it's that's so premised on uh, a sense of permanent ownership, like which it draws, of course, from the colonial history of property. Um, and that, that that's the connection I wanted to draw. I think how we, we can we can bridge the, bridge those concepts. Yeah, that's interesting. I just like to start. <clears throat> Hey, thank you for this profound discussion. You 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 described the, the Zionist project as, as one that cannot get past the facts, mm -hmm. and it finds it find itself in the very beginning embroiled as massive state and variable contradictions. Mm -hmm. um, and you suggest, I think, what I saw that genocide is kind of way out, an insane way out. Um, you know, we, we hope that will not succeed. Mm. So, what is there left for this project? Mm. Uh, you know, it, unless it's utter collapse, which is difficult to imagine. Mm. Yeah, I, it's it's both it's both difficult. Yes, I agree with you, James, and I think it's it's both difficult to imagine, but it it's both somehow there. It's both somehow there as a. It's, it's actually there also at the start. In a certain sense, um, Zionism was always an apocalyptic project. It has that thread within it. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a thread um, that comes back to the surface explicitly in recent years. There's this very infamous uh, interview that the historian Benny Morris does in, I think, 2004 with Aris, with Ari Shavit, where, you know, he's a sort of or a typical liberal Zionist uh, historian, um, a solid historian in many ways, um, and he makes this quite you know explicit turn to a kind of you know, open fascism. He says, I, "I see expulsion on the horizon again." And the interviewer Shavit, who make his own turn in due course after that interview, 
as, as you know, but this could mean the end of us here if we go and make the genocide. And he says, yeah, it's always been a sort of, that's always been the stakes. Mm -hmm. And in a certain sense, that's, you know, an effect of the lateness of Zionism as a colonial project. Uh, it's an effect of, of uh, that expansionary moment in 67 that wasn't able to reproduce what happened in 48 for a number of reasons. Um, so I think that's a strand that's there, right? And um, you know, there, there's something deeply apocalyptic. You know, you know I, I think it was Mbembe or Anijar who talked about it as a, a kind of suicidal state project mm. at, some, at, some, mm. at some level. Right? Um, so I, I uh, you know, it's very hard to imagine it as a, in a sort of uh, immediate sense, uh, but I think it's also very much present. Um, and the, 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 that, that I'm not trying to be sanguine about that in any. I, I think it's going. I think it is, and it will be horrific, and it will be even more horrific. And there are no sort of denouements to projects like this that are not incredibly brutal and, and horrific. But I think there is no way out of this bind. I don't really think there is a way out of this bind in the long term, even if the the worst case scenarios in Gaza happen, even if they manage to push out two and a half million people, it's essentially. Politics of deferral, unless it can be repeated. So, um, yeah, that's that's that, that those the, the, the starkness of those options now I think is very clear, and the the kind of uh, that's why I say the temporality now is this long term temporality. It is only that this this kind of like end game temporality actually, because the politics of you know biding time in a sort of endless holding pattern. Kind of what apartheid is in a certain sense, as I was working on, um, it kind of it, it reaches a crisis point. You know? uh, so yeah, it's it's there. I think the the, the questions are, are are how, and how long, and how bad, and on what terms, and um, but any kind of prospect of uh, transcending these modes, eventually, what kind of prospects will remain? I feel like there are a few questions remaining. I don't know if Jamie and that's like uh, <laughs> and then there's Stefania. Yeah, I had a comment to make, but I can make it later off the record. So maybe I'm gonna ask you, Jamie, if this was a hand. It was a half hand, you were right. Oh, okay. <laughs> I said you were half hand. Yeah. And um, then Stefania. Yeah. Maybe we can take the two questions and then see. ask um not so first. Yeah, so First of all, thank you, thank you so much for this talk and for your work. Um, I guess I have maybe a somewhat trivial question about word choice, and I think please correct me if I'm misremembering. But Sherrod ended the sort of reflection by saying that your book concludes with proposing that the temporal impasse is not a failure but a defeat. Am I remembering that right? Mm -hmm. yes. And I was curious about your choice of word for defeat as opposed to failure because I know that your work takes us beyond sort of the grammar of success and failure which you get at in like revolution after revolution. Mm -hmm. And I was curious like what sort of temporal mm -hmm. frames you think the word defeat offers us as opposed to mm -hmm. failure or success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stefania, would you like to add your question? Uh, it's just in a way, it's a, it, it's a, a small uh, comment on your last question, on your last answer to James, mm -hmm. and to to the to the entire first part of your talk. So mm -hmm. if if there is this fulfillment which is suicidal, then the capacity to remain unsettled, mm -hmm. the camp as. Mm -hmm. I wrote in my notes, the camp is a Benjaminian dialectical image. Mm. Um, the camp, in that sense, is what the possibility of staying in the camp is what allows to the to the non-suicidal to happen. And so it allow it would have, it allows a temporality, which would be a temporality of utopia, call it as you want to call it a futurity, but it's also a temporality that you imagine a completely different life for mm. both, right? Mm. So I wanted you to say something about this. Mm. I just, it, it's actually related to what also James said, and um, this question of permanence that I have to say, I, uh, I use it in my own meaning, and now I just decided I'm completely wrong. 
<laughs> um, because I used to think, I know I know I'm wrong, um, uh, I used to think that what Israel doesn't allow the Palestinians to do with this host demolition, destruction, complete obliteration of infrastructure, of social life, buildings, neighborhoods, is the inability that the, the, the permanence is not possible. You cannot build something that is permanent. And um, that is, you cannot intergenerationally pass memories through permanent structures, through urban life, through. And, and I now realize that I was Arantian, which I didn't realize because I tried not to be. Um, and I remember that the permanence was here Arantian for me and listening to you on. And, have, and, and of course, when I move in Haifa and various places within 48, and I see the permanence of infrastructure, right? That's why, how can you even think of it as failing project, right? Because you see the permanence, and I think what you've given, what you've given me today, I, I didn't notice this before, is, is really, um, the permanence is not a way to stay, to be of the world, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That there are other impermanent ways, if we really think about politics of inhabitation seriously, and then it's the impermanence, and I think it does relate somehow to Sophonia's last mm. comment. But to, to really take seriously impermanence um, is is what I'm now also learning mm. from your. Um, mm. Is what I think could be also a critique of Arantian mm. permanence. Let me mm. put it this way. Mm. Yes. But let me give you then the floor to answer uh, uh, Jamin and Stefania. Uh, no. Just that, just that, that what I saw as the earthly <laughs> yes. in your readings of those novels yes. is exactly, a, I think, attending to this Yes, moment. yes, yes, yes. Wow, these are all really great questions and good comments. And, you know, I have to sit with them all a little bit longer to do them any sort of justice. Um, but let me have a, let me have a go at it anyway. Um, failure and not defeat. And thank you for that. I don't think I was thinking about it in, in temporal terms. I think what I, at, at least the, the distinction, I wanted to say that the impasse is a defeat and not a failure because I wanted to shift the conversation away from Zionism's sort of imminent contradictions rising to the surface, which is partly what's happened, because I think that's partly how I answered Jim's question, it's always been there. Um, but also, it's not just that. The fact that it all comes to a head now in this, you know, genocidal moment is not just because the structure has always been uh, riven with these irreducible contradictions. It's also because the forms of refusal and resistance and persistence, insistence, have extenuated those contradictions. Right. So the insistence on defeat is a sort of insistence, if you will, on to put it in a sort of old-fashioned sense, on the agentic, and the agentic being the Palestinian game, right? There is a subject that forces these things and not just a structural mm -hmm. sort of failure of the system, right? There's a subject that produces that crisis, that keeps that impasse and impasse, that keeps it open, that smuggles the fugitive temporalities into this, you know, accentuates the impasse, that creates that impasse, that makes sure the impasse actually stays impasse. Um, so that, that, I think that, that's the shift that I, I, I wanted to, to make. Um, to Stefania's point, yeah, of course. At, at some level, you know, you can think of, it would be very strange to tell this to Israelis, to tell them that the camp is a horizon for, for your future as well one day. Um, but you can't think of it in those terms, I agree. I mean, there is a, there, you know, in, if the camp is, uh, you know, as, as, as I tried to put it in the end, kind of insistence on uh, a, a return to a, a, a world, a future world beyond the border region. Then yes, of course, it's also an, the camp and return with it is also an invitation in some way. It's an open invitation, and I think there is a there is a certain power in articulating it in in those terms because you know and it goes to the temporary and the impermanence because you know uh, if if the settler is a figure of obsessively fixated with beginnings and ends and lines, you know here is a sort of counterpoint to that. Here is a counterpart to that that actually stems from the very effects that you've produced and that you cannot undo. Um, and so, yeah, I think I, th I think that that that, 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 is, that is a, a, a powerful way to, to form these elements. Um, as to the question of permanence and impermanence, you know, part of part of what motivated 
that turn, part of what motivated the whole, the whole book at some level is a, is a desire to get away from the sense that, you know, it's the Palestinians that are stuck, that are immobile. And they are at some level, of course, also, right? They're subject to all these incredible restrictions on freedom of movement. But I wanted to flip that at a certain level to say, actually, we're not the ones that are stuck at a much more fundamental level. We're the ones that are stuck, really, at core, in a much more profound and much deeper way. Um, and yes, so, so one, one, one way out of that stuckness is to, one way out of our in, in stuckness and immobility is, is, to, is to think beyond the permanent, to think beyond, uh, again, it goes back to this point, right? To think about the temporary as something to inhabit, right? And here I, I borrow a lot from Teresa and Abdul Malik Simone's work that you know, imagines other iterations of urban inhabitation, mm -hmm. right? To inhabit that which is not entirely settled and fixed and not premised on Ontologies and regimes of ownership and having, um, and I, and I think that, that that opens up a whole world. Really. Well, please thank you very much. Thank you.